but just some quick intros. I'm Kat, I'm a product analytics manager at Shift Labs, which is a data and analytics consulting agency based out of Toronto. I'm a 2x Adobe Analytics champ, as Raj called out, and I'm extra passionate about wrangling raw Adobe data feeds and tapping into that rich granular hit level data. And I'm Mandy George, uh, also a member of the Analytics Champions group, uh, user group leader for the Champions Office Hours and a community advisor on Experience League. And as Raj called out, I was also in the Analytics Rockstars this year at Summit. Um, and based on the audience vote, I was the winner of Rockstars. Um, and I am super passionate about error tracking and anti-conversions when it comes to analytics. And although I did live in Toronto for a while, I am now located in St. John's, Newfoundland. Nice. Uh, awesome. Um, so yeah, before you guys start talking about the topic, we get into all the technical details. Um, I would say if in case at any point anyone has any questions, you can drop in the chat. Uh, one of the presenters can take them there, or we can also have a Q&A session at the end of this. Um, all right, so let's get started. All right, cool. sounds good. So today we've got a lot of specific examples that we're going to go through. Um, so it's you know usually best to have a sample website for us to use. And we've got the Adobe Store website here. And because we are talking about search. Wait a minute, yeah. Mandy. I am like so tired about talking about Adobe all, all the time. We already spend so much time and energy and money on them. Is there you know, something else we could use as an example? Do you think we could change things up a little? What, what would you suggest? Well, maybe let's, you know, talk about something we all have in common that we can relate to. Maybe so we're talking to the Toronto user group. We could use a Canadian example, maybe like canadastore.ca, a fictional website used by all Canadians, where you can buy anything like poutine and Caesar cocktails and beavers. Do you think that would work for us today? I think that sounds great. So today we're going to uh, go over two different metrics related to search, search velocity and search quality score. And then we'll talk about how to aggregate your search terms using search classification. And then we will tie it all together. Um, and today we are going to go over a lot of formulas and pieces of code. Don't worry about trying to write all those down. Um, this session is recorded. Also, we have a post on Experience League that we'll give you a QR code for at the end of the presentation where you can read more about our um, presentation. All right, let's kick things off and talk about search velocity. Search velocity is period over period growth in searches, but filtered for terms over a certain volume to cut out the noise. From a tagging point of view, it's very straightforward. You just need the search term made and a traffic measure, which can be as straightforward as visit. Uh, but before we talk about like the build and workspace, let's talk about how it can be used and why this is insightful to analyze versus plain old search traffic. So let's say on CanadaStore.ca our website, these are the top terms search. So maple syrup, Ryan Reynolds, and poutine rounding out the top three. It's clearly you know, the only things that Canadians and Toronto's care about. Week over week, though, the ranking probably isn't changing much. So it's customers coming back to your website or your app to look for the same most purchased items. But let's instead calculate search velocity for each term at a weekly level and then sort descending. Search velocity can help us identify terms that are rising in popularity, but may not have that high search volume. So for example, ketchup chips would have been at the bottom of a report of searches by visits, but it actually had the highest search velocity and is rising in popularity week over week. Search velocity can also be used to identify gaps in assortment or faulty user experiences ahead of trends. So now that we know that the search velocity of ketchup tips is growing week over week, we should probably check out that user experience live and make sure customers are getting meaningful results for that term. Let's build this together now that we've convinced you you need it. Um, step one in a workspace, you're going to pop open a calculated metric builder and then drag in an if function. Step two, as your logical tests in the if function, you're going to use a greater than function, and you'll set visits greater than some kind of static threshold. We've used 500 here, but you'll need to determine something that works for your org based on your search volume. 
And then step three for the value of true, you're gonna set that to be your period over period growth calculation. You'll need some segments based on date ranges to do this. And then for the value if false, you'll just set that to zero. So that's search velocity. It's a very quick, impactful, easy to understand metric that you could probably build right now with the tag you have in place. Cool. So now that we know that we can use search velocity to identify terms that are rising in popularity, let's talk about a metric to measure how each of those terms is performing. Basic metrics like a search click-through rate or a conversion rate can be impacted by factors like pricing or promotion or stock availability, so it can get a little muddy. Let's explore a metric that's solely focused on how successfully your search engine returns results a user is looking for. We'll use another example on CanadaStore.ca. Let's say the search for Canadian desserts returns these six results in this order. But Wait a minute, the Caesar cocktail is not traditionally a dessert. For those who don't know what that is, it's a Canadian tomato-based vodka cocktail. It's delicious on a hot day, but it's definitely not a dessert. And then poutine, also definitely not a dessert. But for some reason, our search engine is bubbling up those products to the top of the page. And it turns out the customers aren't resonating with those two non-desserts. So let's say this is a breakdown of the percentage of total clicks made after searching for Canadian desserts. The Caesar cocktail is only getting 1% of the clicks, poutine is at 3%, and then the more traditional desserts like beaver tails, Nanaimo bars, butter tarts, uh, they are getting more of the clicks. And then when you look at the average position of the clicked items for the term Canadian desserts, let's say that's about four. But how do we know if four is good or bad? Four out of six results seems pretty good. Four out of Sorry, four out of six results does not seem that great, but four out of 400 seems pretty good. Or how do we aggregate across across the thousands of search terms we're getting across the thousands of results that are being returned? How do we action this average position of four? This is where a search quality score comes in. It measures if search results are ranking meaningful results at the top of the page, and it's just simply the inverse of the average position of the clicked item. So for Canadian desserts, because the average position of the clicked items is four, the search quality score would just be one over four or 25%. And then your goal would be to get a search quality score closest to 100% as possible. You might also hear this be called mean reciprocal rank in other lens. In terms of tagging, you need the search term made, a click event, and then the location of the item clicked. We'll dive deep more into the tagging needed in more detail. It's probably the most critical part of building this metric. So let's say a customer clicks the sixth ranked item for the term Canadian dessert. So they click on buttered hearts here. This is what your analytics call would need to look like. First off, you need the search term uh, made, which if you're here today learning about on-site search metrics, I hope you're already tracking. You'll need a counter event for the click from a search results page and a numeric event for the location of the click. So because butter tarts was the sixth ranked item on our search results page, event two is just gonna hold six. The counter event, as counter events do, is always gonna increment by one, but then the numeric event is gonna sum based on the position of the item clicked. Once you have that tagging in place, the build-in workspace is very straightforward. So first, you're going to calculate the average position of the clicked item by taking that numeric event for position and then dividing that by your counter event for the click. And then step two, to calculate the actual search quality score, you just take the inverse and do one over that first metric. And that search quality score, it's only two events to implement, but a quick workspace build resulting in an incredibly insightful metric to determine if your search engine is ranking the most relevant and meaningful results at the top of the page, and then cutting out uh, some of the noise that a search conversion or a search click-through rate would introduce. All right, <clears throat> those are some great metrics, Kat. Now that we have some metrics to assess our performance, let's look at how we can group our search terms together. On any given day, your website can get hundreds or even thousands of unique search terms. And other than the top few terms with the highest amount of traffic, assessing their performance can be a gargantuan task. 
One way that you can handle this is by creating a classification to group search terms into meaningful categories. I'm sure many of you have worked with classifications before, um, but how would you go about building out one for search terms? If you've classified product, you know that you can use the department, class, or other pieces of the hierarchy that they belong to. Doing something like that with search terms would be a great way to assess their performance. But how do we go about determining which search terms belong in which category? So taking a step back for a minute, you might think that it's you know, easy to classify search terms based on the keywords. But let's look at an example on our Canada store here. Say somebody comes to our site searching for beaver and they get the top three results, which are beavers, the animal. Then there is beaver tails, which are a delicious dessert and Beaver Creek Conservation, which is a location. If you were to try and classify the search term beaver just based on the keyword, what group would you put it in? Would it be an animal, a food, or a place? Another problem is that when you're trying to classify based on keywords, you need to capture every variation of a search term. So if we're making a classification for search terms for our provinces, you need to consider any alternative word choices or even misspellings. I'm sure, you know, all of us growing up in Canada trying to learn how to spell Saskatchewan, uh, it's, you know, not really the easiest <laughs> province to spell. So if you're trying to make a classification based on search terms, you need to consider every possible way that somebody can misspell this. You also have to take into account the fact that we're a bilingual nation. Sometimes customers might search for terms in French instead of English. So now when you're building out your classification, you need to consider every search term, every synonym, variation, misspelling, translation. You might be able to do it for one or two search terms, but doing that for every search term is not really going to be possible. So this is why we want to build a classification using the actions that customers do after their search to determine how we should classify these search terms. And we have two ways of building out this search classification. One is using data feeds and the other is using data warehouse. So for anybody that isn't familiar with either of these, data feeds are the raw hit level analytics data that contains all the information you would find in the workspace interface and then some. Uh, it's presented at hit level, so it is the most granular form of data that you can get. You do need to have a data lake set up to be able to drop the files into, um, and then you can use SQL to parse the data and join it to other data sources. Um, it does take a little bit of work to get set up with your data engineers, but once you have it, it's an incredibly powerful tool. Data Warehouse, on the other hand, is available within the workspace interface, so it's a little bit more accessible, especially if you don't have a data lake. Here you can set up a report to extract the data that you need as a CSV, and instead of bringing in 900 columns with data feeds, here you can set up to bring in just the columns that you need. Um, so this is a bit more curated and it can be exported as a one-time file or you can set it up to export on a regular basis. So I'm going to walk through how to build a search classification using both of these. So we'll start with the data feeds. Once you have the data available in your data lake, you want to create a curated clickstream table with the search term, the number of searches, and the products that they interact with. So you'll want to bring in the proper EVAR version of your search term. In our example code here, it's EVAR8. And you can actually see that it says post EVAR8. This is because all of our EVARs and props will have pre and post process versions in the data feed. And in this case, we want to use the post processed version. So then we're going to bring in the product that they click on. Now, depending on how you capture your product product data, it might just be the SKU number or it could be the product name. And then you'll want to have the category that it's assigned to. So if you're building your classification based on product departments, you'll want the department that product is in. 
One caveat with the data feeds is that if your product department in Workspace is built using a classification, that data isn't going to come into your raw data feeds table. You will need to join to the table where your classification lives. Once you do that, you should end up with a table something like this, where you have each of your search terms, the product that they clicked on, the category it's in, and the number of searches. The next step is to define some criteria for your classification and check if one of the categories meet those criteria. So we want to make sure that all the search terms we're classifying have a meaningful impact on our site. So we set a minimum search threshold. For us, it's 75 searches or more in the past month. Now, depending on the level of traffic to your site, this could be higher or lower. Then our second criteria is to make sure that enough of the traffic is going to the same category so that way it makes sense to classify it. In our case, we've got 80% or more of the traffic going to the same category. If, for example, we have a search term that has clicks to two categories and 60% for one and 40% for the other, is that enough to say that the search term should be in one of those categories? Probably not. So this threshold of 80%, while it works for us, you might need to raise or lower it depending on your traffic to find out what makes sense for you. It's unlikely that you're going to end up classifying every single search term on your site, but this will give you a way to look at the terms that have the greatest impact. So looking at our example, we have a search for beaver and clicks to four different products. Two of those products are from the same category, location, but they only have a total of seven searches. The category symbol, on the other hand, has 87 uh, interactions, which is 82% of the traffic share, and it's greater than 75%, which means that it meets both of our criteria, so we can classify the search term beaver as a symbol. Now, say you aren't set up for the data feeds. This is where you can use Data Warehouse. Uh, the process for this is a little bit more manual and can be difficult if you have an extremely large amount of search terms, um, but the process is more or less the same. You want to set up a extract for the time period you're interested in and bring in the dimension for your search term. So in our case, EVAR8 again, uh, then you want to bring in the uh, category that you're going to classify it to. So unlike data feeds, because Data Warehouse is based on the information within the workspace interface, your classifications will be visible here. So you can bring in your classification directly. You don't have to bring in the specific products that they interacted with. Um, and then you want to bring in your success metric. So this can be the number of searches, product views, card ads, um, whatever is relevant for how your search implementation is set up. Um, once you have this set up, export the file. It can take anywhere from a few minutes to a few hours, depending on how big your file is. Once you have the data, you can open it in Excel or in another spreadsheet app. Here you're going to make a pivot table that's going to look very similar to the curated clickstream table that we made with the data feeds. So we can see that uh, we're using the search term beaver again, uh, using the same criteria as before, more than 75 searches and more than 80% of the share. So we have in our table all of our uh, search terms are going down the different rows and the different categories that we're going to look at classifying it into are our columns across the top. And we're going to do this using three formulas. The first one is an X lookup to find the max value. So across the row for that search term, it's going to find the column with the highest number and return the category name associated with that column. Next, you're going to determine if that accounts for more than 80% of the searches. So it's going to take that max value and divide it and divide it by the grand total column. And then finally, you're going to check if it meets your criteria with a nested if statement. 
So the first if checks to make sure there's at least 75 searches. And then the second one checks to make sure that the proportion for the one category is greater than 80%. If both are true, it returns the category name. If either one is false, I have it set up to return the value NA. Um, you can do whatever you want for false values. Just make sure whatever it returns isn't something that's going to get confused with one of the possible category classifications. So step three, regardless of if you've used data feeds or data warehouse, you now have a file with all of your search terms and the categories that they've been classified to. You can use the classification importer to bring this data back into workspace. So make sure that you have a classification hierarchy set up to accept the data, export the template associated with it, and then fill in all of the information. The key column is going to be your search term, and then you can put the category classification values in their relevant columns. With this, you're not limited to just one classification. You can do department, class, subclass, category, basically anything that you want um, to based on your site and how it makes sense to organize your search terms. Um, there isn't really a limit to the ways that you can classify search terms. You can do it based on hierarchies for products, um, like we did in our example, or if your website doesn't have products, you can use the site section that they visit after doing a search, a blog author, service type, article name, anything that makes sense for your site is fair game. Um, and you're also not even limited to hierarchies. You can make classifications based on traffic volume. So one common example is a head mid tail, where head is the few search terms that have the highest amount of traffic mid are the majority of your search terms that have average traffic and tail are a lot of search terms that have very little traffic so you can use this to look at performance based on volume are your search terms with the highest traffic performing well so to recap uh, creating a search classification based on customer interactions after the search can help you overcome many other limitations and challenges based on keywords, synonyms, translations, misspellings, and so on. And it'll let you classify a large amount of search terms with minimal effort. And after a bit of tweaking to the rules, you'll have a high degree of accuracy and take your search analysis to the next level. That was awesome, Randy. Sites and apps can get millions of unique search terms each week, so search classifications or any way to aggregate or summarize that data is so important. So let's now just take what we just learned about search classifications and tie it together with our two metrics, search velocity and search quality. We've got everything in Workspace. You could build a table like what we have on the screen now. So you can apply search velocity and quality metrics to entire categories. and so if looking at KPIs by term is too granular, take a step up and look at them by category. Or do the opposite. If you've got site-wide search velocity and search quality score, use classifications to drill down to category and then subcategory and see what's driving those overall metrics. The possibilities are endless here and with how customizable search classifications can be, you'll be able to tailor your search insights from a search analyst focused on actionability at a term level to senior leadership who's concerned more about overall search performance. Let's recap. So we first talked about search velocity, which highlights terms that are growing in popularity. Search quality score tells you how each of those terms is performing and if it's providing meaningful results to customers. And then Mandy dove into search classifications, which will give you the flexibility to drill up or down depending and uh, pinpoint what's driving that overall performance. Throwing all of that together and you've got some shiny new tools to really dig deep and uncover insights into your on-site search performance. So today we went over um, <clears throat> a lot of different metrics and formulas. You can feel free to scan this QR code and uh, read a bit more about our presentation in Experience League. Um, we're happy to take any questions that you have now, um, but also after today, if you have any questions you want to engage with us further, we are both available on Experience League as well. Wow, uh, this was really great. I never knew that we can 
um, go this way and utilize search in this way. Um, yeah, it was really insightful. Thank you so much. Yeah, in there, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Actually, uh, I used to do just only the search term. Uh, I never went beyond that. Uh, but I have one question. Uh, in the starting of the session, you were showing the uh, that Canada store web application where mm -hmm. you were telling that uh, it captures the position of an element or a product. So is it uh, automatically or do we need to set up something? I mean, you probably have to, to work yeah. with your your uh, IT teams to build up that data layer and then bring that into Adobe Analytics. It's not. Oh yeah, got it. I I thought it is automatically being captured. I mean, for example, if you have thousand of products, and then maybe they maybe sometimes you know IT teams are not ready to do all these implementations. I thought if it is automatic, then that's great. If not, maybe I got your point. No problem. Yeah little bit setup needed. I wish things were this automated. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Actually, our <laughs> teams are like when I used to work for an organization, the team also, uh, you know, push us back whenever we told them to make some changes in the code. And they always uh, prioritize the automatic things. Yeah, there's a very famous saying in our industry that as long as product is getting developed and like analytics has got the least priority. The moment a feature is up, analytics all of a sudden is the highest priority thing. So yeah. Yeah, it's important to have a good balance when features are released on your site, making sure that the implementation is done, um, especially because you can't go back and get historical stuff before it was set up. Um, so for mm -hmm. something like this, if you haven't um, been tracking like click location um, with counter events before, you're not going to be able to go back and get historical, but once you work with your implementation team to get it set up, you'll have that data going forward. So on the click locations, is it a best practice to have um, maybe separate counters for like a PLP or search result page? Or if you wanted to do like a, a quality score for content on a landing page, um, you would count position there also. Would those be, is it kind of best to have those as separate counters or could you count um, PLP locations and content pages in the same event? That's a great question. My instinct is that you'd have like a page name or site section to break things down mm -hmm. by. Um, That's my instinct too. Yeah. Right. If you have yeah. it, one event across both the pages, then you can get a holistic view. Um, yeah. Or if you want to focus on a specific type of page, you can break it down by, you know, page name, site section, whatever else. Perfect. Yeah, I think we're, we're going to have to go back to our implementation and add this in. So just looking for the best way to approach it to get the biggest bang for our, our investment there. But yeah, this was a great presentation, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. I have a question uh, with, uh, on the same slide. Um, since we're tracking the location in, in a counter in a numeric event, mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't it be uh, like, could, could we have also been tracked into a EVAR? Or the yeah. sole purpose of having it as a numeric event is to aggregate or average the location? But yeah, the purpose would be to aggregate. It's funny, like um, Manny and I both used to work at Home Depot, and that was the setup we had for the position um, in the past was having it be put into an EVAR. And like as we were preparing this like content, we were like stuck on that. It's it's in an EVAR. How do you aggregate or sum or summarize that data? So kind of like light bulb moment, like halfway through into our creating our content, we realized, oh, it could be put into an event. If it isn't an EVAR, you wouldn't be able to like sum and aggregate in a meaningful way in workspace. Our original content was like you have to take it out and put it to clickstream and then do all that advanced like detailed analysis there. This is definitely a lot cleaner, a lot simpler, and all in workspace. Yes, I guess that that is one good point. Um, <coughs> excuse me. 
If you aren't currently capturing your click location in an event, if you are capturing it in an EVAR, if you have the data feed set up, you can do this using data feeds. It is a lot more complicated. And I remember our initial slides talking about how to do this with data feeds was at least mm -hmm. twice as long um, because you know anything with data feeds is twice as complicated because you have to, you know, write the SQL yourself and make sure you're aggregating stuff properly. So it, it is still possible to do with an EVAR, just not within the workspace interface. Got it. Thanks. Any other questions? All right, I think um, we don't have more questions and uh, I would like to again, thanks Mandy and Catherine for taking out your time and you know, showering all this insight on us and uh, it was really great session. I enjoyed it and we have this recorded. So this may go live on YouTube channel of Adobe anytime. I'll post a link on um, on LinkedIn and also we'll send a, you know, um, an email to all the members of the group. Sounds good. Thanks for organizing us, Raj. Thanks, Thanks for so attending, much. everyone. It's Thank you guys. great having all of you and your questions. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye.